Good afternoon. We had read there as an introduction one of the accounts of probably the most famous death in history. The death of a Jew in around 30 to 33 AD in the Roman province of Judea, outside the walls of Jerusalem. The Jew was just over 33 years of age, an itinerant preacher who was sentenced to death by crucifixion by the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. The Jewish authorities had demanded the death, for they thought that this Jew posed a threat to their power and he claimed to be the son of God. And the pressure of these Jewish authorities prevailed, even though the Roman governor could see no wrong in the man. The man was, of course, Jesus Christ, and the record of his death is recorded in the four Gospels of the Bible's New Testament, in several of the letters of one of his followers, the Apostle Paul, and also in the writings of the Roman historian Tacitus, who mentions Jesus' death in his history written around 116 AD. But what's so remarkable about the death? Many tens of thousands of people, both in Roman times but also in times before and after that date, have been crucified. Several thousand were crucified at one time following the slave revolt under Spartacus. And Jesus was certainly not the only man wrongly condemned to death by occupying powers. Other religious men have died for their faith and in trying to do good for other people. So why was Jesus' death so special? Well, one thing so special about the death was it was so clearly foretold in the past before it even happened. In our opening reading, there are at least two references to elsewhere in the scriptures to the Old Testament, Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, and we'll look at one of them later. But there are, as as you can see, many references to what would happen and what did happen. And though the putting to death by crucifixion of Jesus was not particularly different to the crucifixion of many other people, Jesus himself was unique. And because of his uniqueness, his death achieved something that none of those other people's death ever could. Our first uh, reference is in the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 4. The writer of this letter to Hebrew followers in the time of just after Jesus wrote these words, Hebrews 4 verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathise with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And it's that last phrase that's so important. Yet without sin. Sin is the breaking of God's laws and his commandments, a failure to live up to those standards required of by God. Jesus never failed in this, and that's what's so unique about him and why his death was so important. We all deserve to die. God is quite clear about that. In the Old Testament, a prophet called Ezekiel records God's words in Ezekiel 18 verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. So God through the prophet says that any soul, any, any life, any person that sins deserves to die. That was God's judgment when Adam disobeyed in the Garden of Eden. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return, he said. And in a just world, there must be a punishment for anyone who breaks the walls. Otherwise there would be anarchy. No one would bother to obey what they were told to do. And God's clear statement was that those who broke his walls would die. Now both Jesus and his followers are clear that we cannot blame anyone else or anything else for what we do wrong and thus avoid those consequences of our actions. Jesus following a discussion with those Jewish leaders who had him put to death says over their rites of washing Jesus said 
Are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So things that cause us to sin, that defile a person, come from within, from their heart. The Apostle James, in his letter that he wrote uh, later in the New Testament, is very clear. It's James 1, verses 13 to 15. James chapter 1, from verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when, death, so when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So temptation which leads to sin comes from within each of us. And this leads to death as a punishment for those sins, for that disobedience. And this problem of sin applies to everyone in all mankind. Paul in his letter to the Romans makes these three statements. We'll quickly run through them. Romans 3 verse 23. Romans 3 verse 23. Paul says, For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. And then two chapters on, Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. And again, one chapter on, Romans 6, verse 23, at the end there of the chapter. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul's quite clear in that letter. All have sinned and all have earned the reward of that sin, the wages as he puts it, which is death. All except, of course, for one man, Jesus, who the writer of the Hebrews says was without sin. And by his death there is this great gift of eternal life that Paul talks of there. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So how can that be achieved? And why is it achieved? As I said, the work of Jesus was prophesied and his death was prophesied in great detail in the Old Testament, especially by the prophet Isaiah. If we turn there to Isaiah chapter 53, we can see one of the prophecies that's quoted in Mark 15. I mean, we could read the whole chapter as a part of this subject, but we'll go in at verse 4. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Or we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked. But with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. 
By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. The prophet there speaks of a, a servant of God, and it's very clear when we read that and the life of Jesus and his crucifixion that he's re- prophesying of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though Jesus did not sin, he was of the same nature as us. We saw that in that quotation we had from Hebrews chapter 4. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathise with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So though Jesus did not sin, he was still tempted, just like all other human beings are tempted. And the writer earlier in Hebrews, in Hebrews 2, puts it this way. Hebrews 2 verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Jesus knew what temptation to sin was like and he is able to sympathise with those who are tempted and fall. And because he was a man, his death was able to save all other men from the fear of death. Well, how is that? Well, the writer says, by overcoming that which had the power of death, which the writer in Hebrews terms the devil. So who or what is this devil? Well, the word used in the original Greek is diabolos. It literally means to slander, to falsely accuse, or to misrepresent maliciously. It's used in John 6 verse 70 by Jesus about Judas Iscariot, the man who was to betray him to the Jewish authorities. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? So Jesus calls Judas a devil because he was to falsely accuse him to the Jewish authorities. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11, Paul uses this same word as a characteristic that women should not have. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanders, and that's this word devil, temperate, faithful in all things. And exactly the same way in his letter to Titus, Paul writes, The older women likewise, though they be reverent in behaviour, not slanders, that's again devils, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So devil represents a type of behaviour or a type of person carrying out that behaviour. In Hebrews 2 verse 14 we saw that the devil had the power of death. So what type of behaviour has the power of death? Well we've seen that already as Paul puts it in Romans 6 23 for the rages of sin is death. Or as elsewhere in Romans, in Romans 5, verse 21. So that the sin have reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life with Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's sin that's the behaviour that leads to death. It's sin that falsely accuses God, saying that when he said, from the day that you eat of it you shall surely die, in Genesis 2, that God was lying and that death does not result from sin. Paul shows us very clearly again in Romans that it's human nature that causes us to sin and thus to die. It's Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 explains the conflict within all of us 
who try to do good. Romans 7 from verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. And what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I grieve the Lord that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good thing that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. And wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul explains that though he wished to do good, because of the sin that dwelt in his flesh because of his own human nature he could not do it and he failed so often and he calls out there in that last verse oh who will deliver me from this body of death he recognised that he could not do it on his own but Jesus overcame that human nature by never sinning and through that God has said we all, not, all do not now need to die So, are we all therefore saved because of this death of Jesus? Do we need now do nothing? Well, Paul, when he wrote to the believers in Turkey, but then was called Galatia, he wrote, it's Galatians 3, verse 22. But the scriptures can find all under sin. We've already seen that, haven't we? We've all sinned and fallen short to the glory of God and what God has asked. But the scriptures can find all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. This gift, this promise of eternal life through what Jesus has done is to them that believe. We must believe or have faith as it's also put. We must believe that we deserve to die for our sins, that Jesus lived and died and that God will reward those who try to serve him. Overlooking their sins because of the death of his son. And yet another of his letters Paul wrote to the believers in Colossae, Colossians 1 verse 21. Colossians chapter 1 verse 21. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, that is he's saying, you who were sinners, Yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable in his sight. If you indeed continue in the faith or if you continue to believe, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So you who were sinners, because of the death of Jesus, you're now reconciled, brought back to God, if you continue to believe in what God has said. <clears throat> Turn with me, please, to John's Gospel, John chapter 3, where it's put again for us in some very well-known words. John chapter 3, from verse 14. John 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And Jesus elsewhere there, it also there explains that this is a prophecy of Jesus' death, that it was to be lifted up, killed and crucified in front of the people. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So God sent his Son to, to die for those who would believe in him, and if we do believe in him, we're not condemned. That judgment of death will be overlooked for us. Jesus died to take away the power of sin and death. He did that for us, who cannot overcome our own human nature, and therefore sin so often and therefore deserve to die. But God says that if we believe in his Son, we shall not perish but have everlasting life. And one way that we show that belief and our acceptance that Jesus' death was for our sins and therefore for each and every one of us is to associate ourselves with that death. Not by being crucified ourselves, of course, but in the way that Paul explains in Romans chapter 6. Let's turn there to finish as our last reading. Romans chapter 6 from verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise you also, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your bodies as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Do you not know that as many have been baptised into Christ were baptised into his death? We're associated with that death, that death that can save us. So we must believe in these things and then associate ourselves with the death of Jesus through baptism. Then striving to serve God and striving not to sin as the best we can but recognising it's the gift of God and not of our own strength. Romans chapter 6. Let's turn there to finish as our last reading. Romans chapter 6 from verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise you also, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your bodies as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Do you not know that as many have been baptised into Christ were baptised into his death? We're associated with that death, that death that can save us. So we must believe in these things and then associate ourselves with the death of Jesus through baptism. Then striving to serve God and striving not to sin as the best we can, but recognising it's the gift of God and not of our own strength.